different to me. They're superficial. Something's changed. I stepped back from the body of Marine Cook and took in her bedroom. There were photographs that I had recognized as part of E.J. Balak's study of Storyville prostitutes. Strange, but fitting for a vice detective. A couple of Asian fans had been framed over the bed, which looked as if it had been slept in, or possibly the bed hadn't been made the previous day. My cell phone rang. I hit a button with my thumb. I felt out of it. Numb. I needed sleep. Did you find her yet, Dr. Cross? What do you think? Give me your best guess on how to stop these terrible murders. You must have figured it out by now. The mastermind was on the line. How did he know? Suddenly I was yelling into the phone. I'm going to take you down. I figured that much out, asshole. I hung up on him. Then I shut the phone off. I looked around the bedroom. Kyle Craig was watching me from the doorway. Are you all right, Alex? He whispered. Chapter 79 When I got back to the Dauphine Hotel, it was 10.30 in the morning. I was too tired and too worked up to sleep. My heart was still racing. There was a message for me. Inspector Hughes had called from San Francisco. I stretched out on the bed and called Jamila back. I shut my eyes. I wanted to hear a friendly voice, especially hers. I might have something good for you, she said when I reached her at home. In my spare time, ha ha, I've been taking a close look at Santa Cruz. Why Santa Cruz, you might ask. There have been several unsolved disappearances there. Too many. I plotted them out myself. Alex, something is happening down there. It fits in with the rest of this case. Santa Cruz was on our original list, I said. I was trying to focus on what she had just told me. I couldn't remember exactly where Santa Cruz was located. You sound tired. Are you all right? She asked. I just got back to the hotel a few minutes ago. Long night. Alex, go to sleep. This can wait. Good night. No, I, I can't sleep anyway. Tell me about Santa Cruz. I want to hear it. All right. I talked to Lieutenant Conover with the Santa Cruz PD. Interesting conversation. Annoying, too. They're aware of the disappearances, of course. They've also noted house pets and livestock disappearing in the past year. A lot of ranches in the area. Nobody believes in vampires, of course. But Santa Cruz has a certain reputation. The kiddies call it the vampire capital of the U.S. Occasionally, the kids are right. I need to see what you have so far, I told her. I'm going to try to get a little sleep, but I want to read whatever Santa Cruz sends you. Can you send it to me? My friend Tim at the Examiner promised to send me the relevant files. Meanwhile, today's my day off. I might just take a ride. I opened my eyes wide. If you go, bring somebody along. Bring Tim, I mean it. I told her about the murder of the vice detective Maureen Cook here in New Orleans. Don't go there alone. We still don't know what we're dealing with. I'll take somebody along, she promised, but I didn't know if I could believe her. Jamila, be careful. I don't have a good feeling about this. You're just tired. Get some sleep. I'm a big girl. We talked for a few more minutes, but I wasn't sure if I'd gotten through to her. Like most good homicide detectives, she was stubborn. I shut my eyes again and started to drift away. Then I was gone. Chapter 80 Jamila was remembering a line from a favorite Shirley Jackson novel, The Haunting of Hill House, which had been made into a really disappointing movie. Whatever walked there, walked alone, Jackson had written. That pretty much summed up how she felt about the murder case and maybe even about her life lately. She drove her trusty, dusty sob toward Santa Cruz. She gripped the steering wheel a little too firmly most of the way, and her hands felt numb. The kink in her neck was getting worse. This was a disturbing case, and she just couldn't let it go. The killers were out there somewhere. They were going to keep murdering until somebody stopped them. So maybe she should stop them. She had tried to get her current boyfriend to go with her, but Tim was covering a bicyclist's protest for the examiner. Besides, she wasn't sure that she wanted to spend the whole day with him. Tim was sweet, but, well, he wasn't Alex Cross. So here she was, getting off Route 1, entering Santa Cruz all by her lonesome. 
all by her damn lonesome again. At least she had alerted Tim that she was going to Santa Cruz, and of course she was a big girl, and armed to the teeth. Ugh, teeth, she thought. She cringed at the thought of fangs and the horrible deaths of all those who had been bitten. She had always liked Santa Cruz, though, maybe because it was practically the epicenter of the Loma Prieta earthquake back in 89. 6.9 on the Richter scale, 63 dead. But then the area had come back. The gutsy little town and the people there had refused to fold. Lots of earthquake-proof construction, nothing higher than two stories. Santa Cruz was pure California, the best. As she drove, she watched a big blonde surfer climb out of a VW with a surfboard strapped to the roof. He was finishing off a drippy slice of pizza, heading into the bookshop Santa Cruz, pure California. There was quite a mix of people here. Post-hippies, high-tech startup folks, transients, surfers, college kids. She liked it an awful lot. So where were the goddamn vampires hiding? Were they here? Did they know she was here in Santa Cruz, looking for their gnarly asses? Were they among the surfers and post-hippies she was passing on the street? Her first stop was the town's police department. The lieutenant, Harry Conover, was totally surprised to see her in the flesh. She guessed he couldn't imagine any detective going out of his or her way on the job. I told you I'd pass along everything I found on the goths and wannabe vamps. Didn't you believe me? he asked. He shook his head of longish blonde curls, rolled his soft brown eyes. Conover was tall, well-built, probably in his mid-thirties, around her age. Jamila could tell that he was a big flirt and that he had a high opinion of himself. Sure, I believed you, but... I had today off, and this case is burning a hole right through me, so here I am, Harry. Better than email, right? What do you have for me? She sensed that he wanted to tell her to get a life, to enjoy her day off. She'd heard it all before, and maybe he was right. But not now. Not with this case still on the boards. I read in a couple of the reports that some of the local ghouls might be living together commune style. You have any idea where? She asked. Conover nodded and even pretended to be concerned. He was also checking her out, she could tell. Obviously, he was a breast man. We never got any confirmation of that, he said. Kids crash together, of course, but I don't know about any commune. There are a couple of hot clubs, Catalyst, Palookaville, and lots of kids share cribs on Lower Pacific Street. She didn't give up, never. But if a lot of kids were living together... Any ideas where that might be? Conover sighed and actually looked a little annoyed with her for asking. Jamila could tell he wasn't the kind of cop who put too much of himself into his work. She would have transferred him in a second if he worked for her, and Conover would have sworn it was a gender thing. It wasn't. He was a lazy, half-assed cop, and she hated that. Lives depended on how well he did his job. Didn't he understand that? Maybe out in the foothills or north around Boulder Creek, Conover finally volunteered in a soft drawl. I really don't know what to tell you. Of course you don't, Harry. Duh. Where would you look first, she persisted, if you were worth jack shit as a cop? Inspector, I just wouldn't be chasing this one too hard. Yes, there have been some curious disappearances around here, but that's true of just about every town up and down the coast of California. Kids are more restless now than they used to be when we were growing up. I don't believe anybody's getting seriously hurt in Santa Cruz, and I sure don't buy that this is the freaking vampire capital of the West Coast. It isn't. Believe me on that. There are no vampires in Santa Cruz. She nodded, pretended to agree. I think I'll try the foothills first, she said. Conover saluted her. If you're finished chasing ghouls before seven or so, give me a call. Maybe we could have a drink. It is your day off, right? Jamila nodded. I'll do that. If I'm finished before seven, Harry. Thanks for all your help, jackass. Chapter 81 She was pissed now. 
Who in their right mind wouldn't be? Here she was, working her butt off in somebody else's town. She parked the Saab on a funky side street in town, near the Metro Center, right across from the Asti Bar. She had lost track of the San Lorenzo River while she was driving, but it was around here somewhere. She could smell it anyway. She had just gotten out of the car when two men appeared. They walked up quickly and flanked her tightly on either side. Jamila winced. They almost seemed to have appeared out of nowhere. Blonde ponytails, she thought. College kids? Surfers? She sure hoped so. They were well built, but they didn't look like weightlifters, more like they came by it naturally. Images of Eros, Hermes, and Apollo came to mind. Muscles that were extremely well defined, virility, chiseled marble. Can I help you fellas out? she asked. Looking for the beach? The taller of the two spoke with tremendous confidence, or maybe it was cockiness. Doubt it, he said. We're not surfers, actually. Besides, we're from around here. How about you? Both of them had the deepest blue eyes. They were incredibly intense. One looked no older than sixteen. Their movements were deliberate and controlled. She didn't like this. There was no one else around to intervene on the side street. Maybe you could tell me where the beach is, she said. They were crowding her physically, standing too close. She wouldn't be able to get her gun out. She couldn't move without bumping into one or the other. They wore black t-shirts, jeans, rock climber shoes. You want to back off a little? she finally said. Just back off, okay? The older one smiled. The dent between his lip and nose was a sexy round hollow. I'm William. This is my brother, Michael. By any chance were you looking for us, Inspector Hughes? Oh, no. Oh, Jesus. Jamila tried to reach for her sidearm in the holster strapped to her back. They grabbed her, took away her gun as easily as if she were a child. She was astonished at how fast they moved and how strong they were. The two of them pushed her down on the sidewalk and handcuffed her. Where did they get cuffs? In New Orleans? The murdered detective? The older one spoke again. Don't scream or I'll snap your neck, Inspector. He said it so matter-of-factly. Snap your neck. The second one spoke then. He was right in her face. She saw the long canine fangs. If you hunt for the vampire, the vampire will hunt for you, he said. Chapter 82 She was gagged, then roughly thrown onto the rear seat of a pickup truck. The truck started up and took off with a jolt. Jamila tried to concentrate on everything about the trip. She counted off the seconds, kept track of the minutes. There was stop-and-go city driving, then faster, smoother riding, possibly on Route 1. Then a very bumpy road, possibly unpaved. She figured the trip took approximately 40 minutes. She was carried inside a building, some kind of ranch house or farm structure. People were laughing. At her? They wore fangs. Jesus. She was put down on a cot in a small room and her gag was removed. You've come looking for the sire, the one who called himself William whispered, his face up close to hers. You've made a terrible mistake, Inspector. This one will get you killed. He smiled horribly and she felt as if she were being both ridiculed and, at the same time, seduced. The one called William touched her cheek with his long, slender fingers. He lightly caressed her throat, stared into her eyes. She was repulsed, wanted to run away, but couldn't do anything. There were a dozen or so vampires here, watching her like she was meat on a spit. I don't know anything about a sire, she said. What's a sire? Help me out here. The brothers looked at each other, shared a knowing smirk. A few of the others laughed out loud. The sire is the one who leads, said William. He was so calm, so very sure of himself. Who does the sire lead? she asked. Why, anyone who will follow, William answered. He laughed again, seemed to be enjoying himself immensely at her expense. Vampires, inspector, Others like Michael and myself, many others in many, many cities. You can't imagine the extent of it. 
The sire stands firm with simple directions for what to think 